Thank you. Well, those of you who don't know me, my name is Ian Callum. I'm design director for Jaguar Cars. Now, a lot of you may not like cars. It doesn't matter. I don't really mind. Um, but what I want to talk to you about is really about branding and really demonstrate with our latest product, which hopefully you will like, and how that fits into the Jaguar brand of old in a very modern way. But uh, first of all, a little bit about me. I started designing cars when I was three years old. Um, and that was 62 years ago. And um, officially, I've been designing cars and actually getting paid for them for 40 years now. So I've done a few. I've been very fortunate. A lot of sports cars, a lot of indulgence. I've had a good time. But, you know, I'm, even at this stage of my life, looking forward to a moment in the, the industry which is changing dramatically. The car industry is about to change in the next 10 years more than it's changed in the last 100. And I'm looking forward to that change because it's going to bring benefit rather than some of the things you may not think are so beneficial. Um, I started at Ford as a career. I designed lots of steering wheels, because that's what you do when you're learning your trade. Lots of steering wheels, lots of wing mirrors, or door mirrors, we call them, and a few dashboards, and I got frustrated. So I left and I started a car company, a design company with TWR, Tom Locks for Racing, and I was very fortunate to design most of the Aston Martins of the past century, the, the last 10, not the past century, the last 10 years of the past century. I then went to Jaguar in 1999. I took Aston work with me and designed the DB9 was the last one that I did. Uh, the Jaguar journey has been tremendous, but it's also been frustrating at times. I want to talk a little bit about branding and how important it is to understand branding. But in the meantime, here are just a few of my simple pieces of philosophy that I've laid out for myself. You know, design creates order out of chaos. I believe this. It has to be something you create that people understand without you being there to explain it. And we're talking about three-dimensional design, two-dimensional design, whatever it might be. But quite often, you've got to create the chaos in the first place to create the creativity. It may be obvious, but some people just forget this. But the order at the end of it is very important. And clarity of design, I really believe in. You know, when you look at something at the end of the day, its message, its story needs to be clear. Again, I'm not there to explain it. It needs to be clear to you whether it's something you like, love, loathe, whatever it is, whether it's a house, a piece of graphic, a, a car, a piece of furniture. The story must be clear to you. That's my belief. Form and function must take form and place in order. When we start off designing a beautiful car, like a Jaguar, and they should be beautiful because that's part of our heritage, you have to decide at the onset how much of this form and function demands areas of themselves. Because often I get into discussion with other people involved, engineers, finance people, finance people, finance people, and there's cost people, and manufacturing. You all know this story. But you must decide at the onset exactly where the balance of that product's gonna be. Otherwise, you'll never have a story to take to the end. So is it gonna be purely about beauty, or about beauty and function, and to what degree? If you want a lot of space in something, buy a transit. If you want to drive something that's really cool and sexy for two people, buy an F-Type. I'm not supposed to sell Jaguars here, I'm sorry, but <laughs> I sold the transit to you anyway. Um, an object should always be fascinating and dramatic and visually an architecture. There's no reason why any object design cannot be amazing or fascinating. If it's not, it's not been done properly. So what I want to talk about is a little bit about the Jaguar brand, but this can apply to anything. One of the frustrations I had when I began the business was I arrived in 1999. Jaguar had gone through 30 years of tradition. And that's what a lot of people remember Jaguar as, a traditional car company. And what happened was during the 50s and 60s, when William Lyons created the business and what it stood for, he then left the business in 1972, thereabouts. And for 30 years, the custodians replicated the company's product. They didn't understand the values so they didn't know what to do, so they replicated, and we became the traditional car company because it looked like previous car, it looked like previous car, it looked like previous car. I decided in 1999, I'd go in and try and change that and bring Jaguar back to where it should have been all this, this time. It frustrated me as a Jaguar fan of many years. And I wanted to demonstrate how you can move Jaguar into 21st century. And we brought it into 21st century, screaming and kicking at times, but this was the whole point. Here's a bunch of old cars. You might see a bunch of old bangers there. To me, what these cars say are innovation, 
technology performance. These are the highlights of Jaguar's time in the 50s and 60s. They were wonderful cars, and they led the world in those very attributes. That's what Jaguar stood for. So it's important to understand Jaguar is about innovation. I say I'm referring to Jaguar because it's the company I've worked with for 20 years. You can apply this to any company with tradition and heritage. Use it, understand it, and then change it to the next level that needs to be, but hold on to the values. Of course, the other sense of value that Jaguar has is style and design, aesthetic. Yes, it still matters. I know a lot of people say to me, form must follow function. Actually, does it really always have to be that pure? I don't think so. We buy things because we love the look of them. That's human nature. Don't deny yourself that privilege. So Jaguar is about flowing lines, clearly, understandable. It's about purity of design. Aesthetically, it's about a purity which we have to be very disciplined at, hugely disciplined at. And of course, it's about great proportions. This is a thing that car designers use a lot, great proportions. Great stance, the way the car sits on the road, how you see it. It's a big picture. It's a draftsmanship, actually. And like anything artistic, if you don't get the draftsmanship right, the painting will always be rubbish. The drawing will always be rubbish. The architecture will always be rubbish. If you get the draftsmanship right, then the object will be right, regardless of the technique by which it comes about. So these are the values of Jaguar. Great style, beautiful style, performance, technology, innovation. It is not about copying the last radiator we did in the previous car, which is a mistake Jaguar unfortunately made for a number of years. Now, in that in mind, how did we move through the years? Well, we've done a number of cars. You see there the lower ones, the F-Type, the XC, of course, the XF. Of course, following a conventional drivetrain pattern, you know, that's the, the, the power unit, the engine, the gearbox, the drive shafts. This is conventional technology that we are bound to use because that's all we know at the moment. However, something happened about three or four years ago. I was offered this. It's what we call electric skateboard. It's a very fast skateboard. You don't want to try it on your own, I can assure you. But this is an electric skateboard. It has two motors in it for the, the geeks in here, 200 kilowatts each. This is a very quick skateboard. And, but look at it. Look at the freedom it's suddenly given us as car designers that we can do with the future of cars. We're not incumbent now with a great big engine and a gearbox and a drive shaft, everything connected by pieces of metal. We have two motors sitting between the wheels, and that's basically it. Yes, we need other bits and pieces. We need transformers and, and, and induction machines and stuff, but they can be put anywhere because they're joined by cables rather than nuts and bolts. The greatest freedom we could ever expect. So we decided that the next car we do, which is called the I-Pace, by the way, this electric car. Incidentally, also the first electric car. Oh, I'm doing my PR bit again, sorry. Coming out of Europe. We beat them all to it, never mind. Um, we decided it would be an SUV, sports utility vehicle, one of these tall things. The reason being two reasons. One is SUVs become very popular, slightly easier to sell perhaps than cars these days, but I think that may change. And also because we're, we, we're, we're held by a certain amount of height in the car in the battery height. It's about 125 to 130 millimetres of height. Now, if you're going to need a sports car, that's a problem to me. And we'll get around that eventually, trust me. But for the moment, with this technology, we have to live with the height of the car getting taller. So let's do an SUV. It, it takes a lot of pain out of the process. So we just created an SUV called the um, F-Pace, very popular one. It has all the values of a Jaguar. It's got dramatic proportions. I forgot to mention that. Part of that beauty is about drama, and it's about exaggeration. And if you want to get something to look exciting in anything, give it exaggeration. Not crudely, not badly, but with subtlety, but give it exaggeration. This car's exaggeration. The bonnet is longer because it's got an engine in the front. It's got a swooping roof line, which we worked very hard to give it some visual drama. A lot of it created by aerodynamics. <clears throat> but it's a dramatic-looking car. So there's our SUV. We know our SUV. We understand it well, sells well. So let's put that onto this platform. What I realized was this platform, we can move people forward. We could change the package. And by the way, it's designers that make these decisions a lot of the time, not just the engineering people and the package people. We decided to move the people forward because we had room to do it. We didn't have a great big engine in the front. So this gives us another sort of SUV, a different shape altogether. But I struggled with this because it suddenly became very neutral. It didn't have that drama anymore. It wasn't what we call cab rear. 
It's cab forward, yes, but it just didn't have that drama. Now, I remember many years ago, I went to design a five-seater family car, mid-engine sports car. Difficult because mid-engine means the engine's in the back, so you can't put anybody in the back, so therefore it cannot be a five-seater. Bit of a conundrum, really. But if you give designers the opportunity to create the perfect shape indulgently, this is what they'll come up with. It's a car we did 10 years ago called CX-75. It happened to be a very sophisticated, hybrid, electric, and petrol-driven sports car. Very, very impressive car indeed. We only built five, unfortunately. We didn't put it in production for a number of reasons I won't go into, but a very sophisticated car. But the point is, given designers a free hand, this is what they'll come up with, this indulgence, this piece of beautiful design. And I always thought, well, why don't we take the whole notion of a mid-engine sports car, which we felt was very exotic and sexy, and turn it into this. And at last, we have the opportunity to take our new platform, which is built for five people, and the luggage, and turn it into a cab-forward, five-seater family car. So this is what we came up with. So hopefully you start to see the resemblance, what we can do with something as conventional as a five-seater SUV. The difference now, of course, is we're throwing the visual volume towards the front. We're giving the drama towards the front. The car is powering towards the front. So all these lines you see are now throwing energy towards the front. This is kind of designer speak we talk about a lot in the car business. But the point is it's got excitement back again. And these, are, these things are very important, of course, to Jaguar. This follows our tradition. This is our heritage, excitement and exaggeration. So we're following it to T. And of course, the technology is there. The innovation is there. It's already there. It's been given to us. And so that, we bring this car into the car that we see today. <clears throat> and this is iPACE. This is the car we produced from this electric platform. And we finished this about uh, 18 months ago. I'm very proud of this car because it does change the face of the car industry in so many ways. It's pure electric. It's got a range of about 250 miles. It's an incredible thing to drive, I have to say. It's amazing. But it will carry five people in great comfort and all the luggage. So I've finally got my mid-engine or cab-forward sports family car on the road. Now, just a little bit about the process by which we get there. Um, I can't do any of these without actually showing you some of our drawings and, and models. So we start off with sketching. I'm putting this in because it's important to emphasize any designers designing anything in 3D now, I insist they're able to draw. That is our communication. That's how we talk. Now, a lot of designers say, well, I can go straight into 3D and alias or whatever 3D model they might use. That's fine. But the initial ideas have to go into paper very quickly. And to go through in a CAD model to do it is not quick enough. So I insist that my designers are able to draw to this capability. Now, this is Photoshop, but we still render with pencil and paper. We still start off ideas this way. Incidentally, while well, I mean, you're thinking, this car has got a radiator grill at the front, you'll notice. That's because electric cars need radiators, just in case you wonder, contrary to popular belief, because batteries need cold. Just a point of technology. Now, from this, we build three-dimensional models, and that's the master. And we create these two-dimensional models with a, with a software called Alias, I'm sure you're aware of, from Photoshop to Alias. And that is the models that we, these, these are the models that we, we reiterate with all the inputs, and we're getting hundreds of inputs all the time. Again, this is why the emotional value that we put in as designers is so important, because if we follow all the inputs, all the metrics, all the attributes, and there are hundreds, you'll end up the same car every time. Of course you will. That's what happens. So we have to manipulate these to make sure we get the emotion back into the vehicle, and that's what designers, that's what car designers do. Incidentally, we use a lot of augmented, augmented uh, um, tools now. We do all our interiors with augmented tools. We sit in interior box, we design them, we sit in them, we look around them, and we readjust them literally while we're in the buck in real time. So it's very, very clever stuff. But this may surprise people. This is very traditional. We then go into a clay model, and we create a clay model out of the digital information, and then we hand carve it because that's the only way you can get the real emotion of form and design to work properly. People model this by hand with direction from designers. It is so important we get that human element back into the feel of a car. And every car you see in the road now, whether you're interested in or not, 
They've all been sculpted this way at some point. Some of them better than others, admittedly. But the amount of time we will spend just doing a body side like that may take months to get it absolutely sculpturally correct. And that's very much part of the emotional value that we put into our cars. <clears throat> now, you're remissing me of not to talk about the interiors. The interiors go through the whole same process. You'll notice in the eye page, we haven't got a great big iPad in the middle. And that's very deliberate. I don't believe when you're doing 80 or 90, sorry, when you're doing 70 miles an hour. <laughs> I'm sure you none of you go over 70. You want to be looking through menus to find out how to control your seats or your heating or the fan speed or whatever. You need to be able to use these tactilely. So we have a split of screens. I've got five digital screens in this car, all split in different sectors of importance in the right place. And they all talk to each other and they all do fancy stuff. But the point here is we split a lot of the controls into manual haptic controls that you can still operate and still look at very quickly and you still get that tactile mechanical feedback from the car. Again, back to our values, that performance vehicle that you have some relationship with. So no digital pads this size because one, I don't think they're particularly safe, but secondly, I love the idea of a tactical control in the car, tactile control in the car that you can enjoy while driving. In fact, I drive my car every day. I use the controls all the time. I don't even have to look at them anymore because they're so instinctive. If we were to do it in a touchscreen, oh, what's happened in front of you? It's amazing how fast you can go at 70 miles an hour, how far you can go at 70 miles an hour in just one second. So we continue this philosophy of breaking our controls into areas of digital and tactile controls so that that feeling you're in a machine that you're in control of still exists. Of course, the haptic is still created artificially. But it's not the point. It's the feeling that matters, the emotion that matters. So that's our iPACE. That's the car we've created based on something which is brand new, one of the most up-to-date cars you can buy in the world today. Personally, I think it's one of the best, but... It's just won the World Car of the Year Award, the World Car Design Year Award, and the World Car Green Car of the Year Award. So it's done very well. Thank you. And you can imagine, for that reason, we're all very proud of it because we've done the right thing. A car built from the ground up with integrity and for the right reason. But the values of Jaguar are still in that car in every way possible. Thanks for listening.